Hi friends, my name is Trish Roberts, you're watching Faint Signals from Vega. So I wanted to quickly um, talk about some, a revelation that I heard in the Ralph Nader News Hour um, by Professor Noam Chomsky, and I don't think either of those people need introductions. Um, and uh, Noam, I'm going to play you this short uh, minute ep excerpt from this interview with uh, Ralph Nader by Noam Chomsky about the transportation industry and uh, regulation of emissions. Well, it's kind of interesting to see the way across the spectrum how this is being dealt with. I mean, at the right, say, the Trump administration produced one of the most astonishing documents that has ever existed in human history. I'm not exaggerating. A bureaucracy, naturally. The Transportation Bureau came out with a long, detailed document which was arguing it was leading to the conclusion that we shouldn't have any constraints on emissions in transportation cars trucks and so on just let them emit everything you know no matter what and the it had a very interesting argument the argument was look at the rate of global warming now taking place by the end of the century it'll be maybe they estimated you know 7 degrees or something like that a higher and by then, we're, we're basically over the cliff anyway. There's no chance of survival after that. So what the hell? Why not just enjoy it while we can? Of course, the tacit assumption is that everyone in the world is as criminally insane as we are, as they are, you know, and will not try to do anything about it. Can you find any document like that in human history? I mean, you know, Nero is supposed to have filled while Rome burned. These guys are saying, let's enjoy ourselves while the planet burns to make it, more profit for the next couple of years. It invites the phrase institutional insanity. The evidence is all around us. It's no longer just models of climate scientists. It's devastating floods. It's devastating hurricanes. It's rising sea levels. It's spreading disease because of habitat changes. It's extinction of species. And these people who are in power got their heads in the sand or their minds are so monetized by Exxon Mobil and others that they refuse to see what's coming up. I mean, so isn't that an amazing revelation? And yet it's not surprising because I've even, I've said this myself uh, in various uh, videos that, um, and, you know, in private that uh, I just feel like the oligarchs know that it's all over and that they um, sort of think to themselves, well, you know, We'll just go for it. We'll go full on with the nuclear arms race and try and dominate the world as we always intended, the U.S. oligarchs and um, the military industrial complex, the national security state. We'll just go for it, you know, pull out of all, pull out of all the nuclear uh, treaties and then just try and aim for world domination. Because what does it matter if we accidentally have a nuclear war? Um, because, you know, it's going to end anyway. Um, so there's that. But but this this sort of just shows how. Uh, really, that the administration and prior administrations probably know that it's all over with now. Uh, that we're going to we're going to head for a um, well, well before 2100, 2100, we're going to be heading for um, as baked in is a three degree Celsius increase, and I've talked about that just recently. Uh, so I won't go into that. And um, but you know, by the end of the century, we'll we'll most likely be completely out of control and it could be like seven or eight degrees celsius so it'll be well and truly over by then but it'll be probably be well and truly over by 2050 2060 but anyway they probably just said to themselves oligarchs well you know let's they were probably going to do this anyway but uh it just sort of uh, reinforces to them well let's just go for it and let's um you know make as much money as we can uh when you see people like D diane feinstein talking to those children who came with their parents to see her. You've probably seen it now. It's been going around uh, the media. So here's a little sample of that video for those who are not familiar with it. We are trying to ask you to vote yes on the Green New Deal. Oh, please. Okay, I'll tell you what. We have our own Green New Deal. Some scientists have said that we have 12 years to turn this around. Well, it's not going to get turned around in the, 10 years. The what we can do Senator, if is this put doesn't get turned around in 10 years, you're looking at the faces of the people who are going to be yeah, living with these consequences. What? The government and is supposed to be for the people and by the people and all of the people. You know what's interesting about this group 
is i've been doing this for thirty years i know what i'm doing you come in here and you say it has to be my way or the highway i don't respond to that i've gotten elected i just ran i was elected by almost a million vote plurality and i know what i'm doing so you know maybe people should listen a little bit I hear what you're saying, but we're the people who voted you. You're supposed to listen to us. That's your job. How old are you? I'm 16. You I can't vote. Well, you didn't vote for me. Well, she, I'm she voted. It doesn't matter. We're the ones well, going to be impacted. It doesn't matter. We're going to be the ones who are impacted. Yeah. I understand that. I have seven grandchildren. They voted for you or not. I understand it very well. Senator, the cost of and not taking this action is far higher than the cost of what the Green New Deal will be. And there Here's is enormous what? popularity for this bill around okay. the whole country. Here's and we're asking you to be brave proposing. and do this for us and for your grandchildren. Get enough for everybody. I'm trying to do the best I can, which was to write a responsible resolution. Any plan that, that doesn't take bold, okay. transformative okay. action is not going to be what we need. Well, we need you know better than I do. Why so I think one day you should leadership. run for the Senate. Great. And then you do it your way. But by that time, you. in the meantime, by that time, there's going to be a big problem. I just won a big election. She violated almost every rule of how to speak to young children, and she proved her point again and again. That she's tone deaf. She's full of herself politically. She brandished the 30 years experience language. And, of course, it's 30 years of ignoring the need for a transforming shift to renewables and energy efficiency from fossil fuels and nuclear. She has supported the fossil fuel industry, and she has taken money from the fossil fuel industry for her campaign. So she basically was more than patronizing. She demonstrated to these young people how much more vigorous they have to be and how much more focused they have to be to replace the ancient regime of indentured corporatist politicians like Dan Feinstein. And here's the thing that had me cursing at the TV, which was the following Sunday on Meet the Press on NBC. But the supposed real enemy of the people is, is according to Trump. And it's Chuck Todd. He's introducing the video. And this is what Chuck Todd said. I think a lot of people look at a lot of that, Andrea, and think, uh, boy, she could have been more uh, less tone deaf in how to talk to the kids. And who are the adults that are using kids to, to practice politics? It was the whole thing was uncomfortable, very uncomfortable. And let me just say, I think, first of all, she is a leader on this subject. So why didn't they go after someone who's against climate change? She has legislation. She's saying, I don't want to sign on to the new Green Deal because it's aspirational. It's not legislation. I'm working on something that's real. Also, who are the adults who bring their kids who don't understand this stuff? Seven, eight, nine, ten year olds. I understand the passion of children and how important it is. But to ambush a senator this way. Well, Andrea Mitchell has been on TV saying very similar things over the years. So that's no surprise. The problem with corporate indentured politicians is they don't understand the clarity that is being communicated to them by these youngsters. These youngsters don't have the baggage that becloud the conscience and intellect and factual urgency of politicians. They don't have that. They don't have an ax to grind. That's why they have great moral authority. That's why there should be tens of thousands of 9, 10, 11, 12-year-olds mobilized to confront the 535 members of Congress and their state legislatures. And maybe the politicians will be surprised that some of these 10-year-olds actually have more factual knowledge and content than the so-called politicians with all their years of experience. It's just amazing to see the lack of the elderly politicians' sensitivity to these youngsters. They don't even have a sense of an arm around the shoulder. They don't even have a sense of conveying wisdom. They get up on their high and horse and become very defensive and start saying, well, maybe when you run for the Senate, you can do it your way. There's no doubt that Senator Feinstein recognizes the climate crisis. And she's not a denier. But over the years, she has not ruffled many feathers 
in the omnicidal saturation of the planet with greenhouse gases by the fossil fuel industry. And she wasn't a leader in opposing nuclear power. The nuclear power plants in California were being shut down and are being shut down in spite of the senator from California. Here of Dianne Feinstein being totally clueless with children who are talking about their, their lack of future because of climate crisis. And Dianne Feinstein was really quite rude to them. And, you know, I know what I'm doing. I've been doing this for 30 years. In other words, you're clueless, go, go away. She also said, you know, well, well since you know everything, you, you should, um, you know, eventually run for senator and uh, then you can address these issues. Dianne Feinstein's about 86 years old. So if she lived to say, you know, the... Uh, really long life. She's probably got 14 years left on the planet, one four. So she'll be gone before, you know, the shit really hits the fan badly. It's hitting the fan right now. Um, and it's the train is, you know, three quarters way over the cliff. But, you know, she'll be gone before, um, you know, we start to suffer extreme, um, extreme events and uh, and possibly, you know, bordering on starvation. She'll be gone before then, or starvation, because plants won't be able to survive and adapt, etc. cetera. Um, and of course, not to mention all the uh, other species that'll be going with us. But, she, you know, so she doesn't have to worry, and so she patronized these children. She's been um, ha receiving donations from the oil industry. So people like that, they have no interest in really, they've been so used to behaving like this and they're so out of touch with everyday people that, you know, they, they just, they don't really care. You know, that's the bottom line. Same with Nancy Pelosi and people like that. They're multi-million. Nancy Pelosi has about $100 million and she didn't get that from hard work. She got that from, you know, holding, hosting big donation um, gatherings and, um, you know, benefits and stuff and, and receiving lobbyist money. That's how she got that. And Dianne Feinstein is very wealthy too, I imagine. The rest of them, I mean, Congress, basically the 500 and, what is it, the 535 people, most of them um, are receiving money from all sorts of lobbyists. But anyway, um, the, you know, this is the, the state of affairs when, you know, the, you know, it's actually the most bizarre document to write that, you know, well, it's going to be, it's going to be all over by the end of the century, so let's just not have any sort of um, regulations whatsoever. Capitalism at its finest. And, um, and, you know, you, if you've been watching my channel for a while now, you know that in the beginning of the year we had serious fires and today it's restarted again because uh, they've never really gone out. But across the river we have smoke once again and that's because we had a very, very hot day yesterday, one of the hottest um, since uh, the 1940, I think it was. So now we have smoke all over the place. There's not enough smoke over here that I can't sit outside, but I can smell it and I can see it. Um, let me see if I can show you. That's that. Um, and I just want to move on now to, uh, um, I was watching On Contact with Chris Hedges. And um, Chris Hedges um, was interviewing Professor um, Roxanne Dunbar. She was talking about the Second Amendment. Now, I've talked about the Second Amend Amendment here the U.S. Second Amendment. And by the way, speaking of the Constitution, please check out my video I did yesterday, uh, which is hardly any views, and I find that interesting because it's, um, I've actually picked out an excerpt by Colonel Wilkinson where he talks about the Koch brothers and how they're um, organizing to rewrite the Constitution, and they've got about 36 states, something like that. It was a 28, I don't know, 28 or 20 or 36 and they just need another six states, and then they can, uh, they can sort of um, go ahead. They can do a convention about the Constitution and rewrite the Constitution. You can imagine now what the Koch brothers would do uh, with that and what they could, could do with that. That's a scary thought. So anyway, about, back to the Second Amendment. Um, she was talking about the, um, how the Second Amendment was born in, in white supremacy because a lot of people willfully like to pretend that the Second Amendment is about, is about people being able to arm themselves to overthrow the government. But really, they already had a state militia at the time. And the reason they, um, the reason this Second Amendment was brought into being was to control um, uprising slaves and to kill them and also to 
to kill indigenous people and take their land. And it was enforced. I'll, I'll play you a little excerpt. Let's go to the Second Amendment, uh, which is what your book is, is about. Uh, talk about why the Second Amendment, because there's, I think, a historical, uh, probably, I think you argue, willful misinterpretation of what the Second Amendment was for. Yeah, the Second Amendment was put into the Constitution as one of the um, ten enshrined individual rights, rights of man, uh, right next to free speech is the Second Amendment, the, um, the right to bear arms. So it is very clear from the context of his history of the time, there were no arguments about this, you know, whether or not should it go in or it's a, a settler democracy, settler colonialism. It, you, every settler is a soldier, basically, individual soldier. So the well-regulated militia, which people get hung up on and think that means state militias, but the state militias were provided for in the Constitution, Article 3. Well, you argue before the Second Amendment was actually put in place. They were already existent. Yeah, it was already um, uh, the state militias. Uh, they came to be called the National Guard later. Uh, so there's no relationship. Uh, the, the Ten Amendments really are about individual rights. So you can't, you have to... You have to follow that logic and discover what is it about then. And, of course, since I do indigenous history, it's obvious, knowing that history, that these individual settlers, uh, at first they had the duty laws forcing well, they them. They were required to they have were weapons required. in their home. And they were fined if they didn't. They right. were fined. And they also could uh, uh, ask for aid if they couldn't uh, afford the weapons. But they had to have weapons. They had to uh, carry them in any public space, including the church, out in the fields. And what were they, what was it for? Who was around trying to get their land back that had been stolen or to prevent further expansion? Native Americans. You write that the Declaration of Independence of 1776 symbolizes the beginning of the Indian Wars and westward movement that continued across the continent for another century of unrelenting U.S. wars of conquest. This or that was the goal of independence with both the seasoned Indian killers of the Revolutionary War and white settler rangers militias using extreme violence against indigenous noncombatants with the goal of total domination. That's where the Second Amendment comes from, although you also write about slave patrols. Yes. By 1670s, um, these, these militias had existed already since 1607. They were built into the very first uh, colony, uh, John Smith uh, headed, you know, organized the settler militia. Um, so in the 1670s, when racial uh, slavery was established, codified in the colonies, they then um, were, you know, where it was only black people and, um, and their children would be slaves, would inherit that for life. Um, there was, was no out. Um, they borrowed the slave patrol idea from the settlers of Barbados, the British settlers who came uh, to South Carolina to establish, well, they came to Virginia to establish the South Carolina uh, colony, and they, they were a very brutal uh, class of slave, you know, worse than most. So they brought their slave patrols with them, that and idea. And the slave codes. Yes, and they, um, they then spread. These were restrictions on movement, you had to have passes. And all. every citizen had, was re then responsible. You know, later that was made into a congressional act in the United States, the uh, Fugitive Slave Act, where every white citizen was responsible to detain any loose black person. Right. Uh, you write in the book that uh, you characterize the uh, colonization of the United States, I think correctly, uh, from this, you use the term savage war, and that savage war, petite guerre, military annals, uh, is uh, about unlimited war and irregular war, uh, that accepted, legitimized, and encouraged attacks upon and the destruction of non-combatants, villages, and agricultural resources in shockingly violent campaigns to achieve their goals of conquest. And you make the point in the book that that conception of uh, settler colonial violence remains within our DNA, that this is where it comes from, but nothing has changed. It does, because it hasn't come to consciousness that that's what it is about. And it lurks in the rural areas, it seems, but also in the urban areas, uh, in pockets uh, where people have migrated. Uh, and the, uh, the modern police forces clearly have a genealogy uh, going back to the slave patrols. And that's the only way to explain this, this um, sort of knee-jerk reaction of shooting young black men in the back when they're walking down the street or driving or whatever. Um, and I, well, also, It also characterizes the way we waged war in Vietnam, the way we wage war in Iraq, Afghanistan. 
and the fact that we call that Indian country. Yes, they will use, as you talk about in the book, mm -hmm. they will even use, as they did in Vietnam. Yes. They will use those uh, metaphors of, right. of, of the West. And they call a rolling thunder the, you know, the bombing, uh, clear cut bombing, uh, rolling thunder. They use the names of military weapons, of, you know, the Chinook. And um, it, to me, it's like war trophies. You know, they're, they're, they're relive, reliving the past. And I tell the story of the, um, of the young men who do the Mohawk uh, imitation dance before they go into Iraq. And that, that's built into the Army training. It's a generation to generation of officers because the Army itself um, has that heritage. And they kept trying to um, modernize the Army to be like, you know, regular soldiers fighting on battlefields. They had that capacity, but they tend to always then fall into the counterinsurgent kind of anti-civilian, because counterinsurgency really means attacking civilians and their, and their food supplies starving. Well, it was peculiar to the Puritan Puritans, because they viewed the indigenous communities, Cotton Mather and others, as satanic. They, 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 right. they, and that their eradication was about purifying the earth. And, and they thought it was catching, you know. The, the, uh, they had this ideology they built up that justified the savage killing, uh, the bounties that became a, uh, first on heads and then oh, the scalping. on scalps. Uh, it, was a, it was a real commerce, a real trade. Um, people made their livings off this. And, of course, they could then, you know, kill a child, kill anyone. You can't tell what sex a, a scalp is or what age the person is. Um, and uh, turn them in. You know, it, uh, it was corruption. Well, let's talk about how this has sustained and feeds white supremacy. Well, that's a really important link, and I have a chapter on that, because I, um, in one respect, um, U.S. nationalism, the national narrative, is white nationalism, that we're all fed. Um, it's a kind of low-grade white nationalism, not acted out. But there's always been the, you know, the, the sort of voluntary militias. They're coming back because they feel threatened uh, that everything they fought for, that they shed blood for, taking the land, I mean, literally, you know, bloodbath across country and generations and generations, um, that they're losing that. So you see the rise again. But it's uh, basically to restore that um, the United States, as it was founded, to go back, the whole originalism, in a way, the whole Supreme Court, you know, that, well, the majority, is a white nationalist right, now right. in the sense of originalism because the, the changes in the Constitution that can be made, and it's so difficult, uh, was, was beginning to break down some of that with the end of slavery, with women's rights, uh, uh, even labor rights. And that that's lost now. I'm not sure the Constitution can ever be a positive uh, instrument for social change anymore. Powerful, obviously, um, a politically powerful organization that plays to the mythical version of what the Second Amendment is about, which is absolutely. individual liberty. Individual liberty and overthrowing the government. It's kind of, but I think the hardcore white nationalists really know what it's about, that it's about uh, brown and black people, it, that it's fundamentally racist, um, even though they're trying to recruit women and they're trying to recruit to people, some people well, of color. Well, one of the things that's important to recognize is that because of the legal system, we've largely criminalized uh, gun ownership for people of color, yes. because they're in urban areas primarily, while rural America has arsenals, I, much of my family comes from Maine, and my own family is guilty of this. Um, uh, and then, of course, as I talked at the top, that w we're talking about really arming white men. Right. And, and the average gun owner owns eight guns, only 30 percent. Well, of my them. neighbor in Maine owned 23. Yeah, so that, <laughs> that means most own yeah. more than eight guns. Let, let, let's talk about mass shootings, which you talk about in yeah. the book. The first notable mass shooting in 1966, and... Uh, it's not counted because there were no more of that character until 1982. Mass shootings are, are a relatively recent phenomena. It, they're a recent phenomena, and, and I think there's no doubt about it. They're parallel with the rise of um, what I call the counter-revolution uh, in the 60s, the John Birch Society, the, uh, all of these things formed after the Brown versus Board of Education uh, Supreme Court decision, immediately white citizens' councils, uh, and it, it was a... It was a, um, uh, a real earthquake for, um, I think, for uh, probably, uh, certainly 
the white people who are descendants of settlers, like my father's family, the, the Scots-Irish, um, which are very numerous in the United let, States. Let me just move on, because we're, you write, it may be that the mass killings at home are easier to grasp, condemn, and mourn than those perpetrated as military operations in the name of the people of the United States, paid for with their taxes and soldiered by their children. You draw a direct link. Right. It's killing civilians. It's killing, uh, arbitrarily killing. And a war may start on other bases, you know, with troops and fighting, and like the, the Gulf War. Uh, but it inevitably turns into a shooting spree. Like even Timothy McVeigh's um, testimony about his experience as a gunner shooting down those um, Iraqi soldiers who had their right. hands up right. and had dropped their arms trying to um, to uh, uh, to be taken in. There's, he was he was aiming at them, shooting them. The United States is the largest exporter of military weapons in the world, totaling nearly forty billion dollar sales in two thousand and fourteen. Uh, of the Earth's top. Ten weapons manufacturing, seven are in the U.S. What, what is this about, this manufacturing of the world's weapons about that come from the United States? Yes, and in the United States, uh, we have owned 50% uh, of the small arms in the world, and we're 5% of the population. So um, a lot of it's domestic consumption. But I think in a militaristic society where every settler is a soldier, this is so much in the culture that even those who are not armed um, have a kind of um, uh, respect. You know, even on television, when they have someone who's a, for gun control and he's a Marine or a sharpshooter right, or right. something, he has so much more clout in, in talking than someone. Well, who's... we've made weapons like the Winchester, which you write about in the book, iconic. Iconic, yeah. And th that Winchester was made specifically for the Plains War to right. kill, you know, rapid fire. Um, a horseback uh, with a rifle, um, killing Indians, Plains Indians, and buffalo. Um, um, there is an inability on the part of the American citizenry, in essence, to confront their own history. And because of that, there is an inability to confront who they are. It's a, it's a real identity problem. I think it's why people seek... Um, ethnic identity or women identity or queer identity is um, the national identity is either embraced and it's basically white nationalism or it's kind of avoided and uh, but the rhetoric of it you know uh, continues that people will defend it and um, but I think that that uh, the I identity of a, a suppressed well this is again Richard Slotkin his use of psychoanalysis right. theory and all I think we almost need that, and there are some, you know, historians working in that way with psychoanalytical uh, tools to understand how the subconscious um, uh, drives certain actions, like those mass killings. And part of it is, you know, a society, especially with so much television now, social media, um, there's a person on the edge, let's say a, a person uh, on borderline personality. Um, who absorbs all this and already has some confusion about um, who, the, who the person is, and often it's a white man with uh, doubts about his masculinity in the society, and um, that person then decides to act. And that's the story you get you know, from so many of the... Well, they decide deeply. to be violent. They decide to be violent. Because out of the cultural DNA of America, and we have to stop there, that's come in a very sick way yeah. to define what it means to, to, for manhood. And it's a form of suicide. It is a form of suicide. Thank you. That was historian Roxanne Dunbar-Ortiz, author of Loaded, The Disarming History of the Second Amendment. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you. Thanks. So anyway, that's all I really wanted to say. It's probably not a very good explanation, so please excuse me. Um, but um, I just thought there were two interesting things that um, you, would like, you might like to check out. Um, you know, one of the reasons I do this channel is because um, if I find something that I think is particularly, particularly important, um, I don't do, I don't cover everything like other people. I don't have the time for one thing, and I'm no, I'm no kind of journal. I'm not a journalist. I'm just a nobody who just started this because I, I want uh, these imperialist wars to end, and I also want people to go vegan. That's the other thing. So I do this. I do this channel. Um, just to be just another little tiny voice in amongst a very small few people who are doing sort of talking about left news and talking about anti-war, anti-imperialism. 
And uh, so that's why I pick certain things that I think are, are, are sort of, um, they're concise versions of something that we all need to be aware of. And, you know, when I hear somebody explain it in a very concise and clear way, um, and in a condensed way, it's sort of, um, I, I find that very useful and you probably do too, particularly if you, if you know somebody and they don't know much about a particular issue, you can sort of say, well, check out this particular excerpt and that explains it very well. And so, so when I hear things that are complaint can, uh, that are explained very, um, concisely and stuff, it, it always appeals to me to put in an excerpt into my videos uh, because they can explain it a lot better than I could. Um, so anyway, um, I thank you for watching. Please click the notifications bell if you subscribe because you won't receive updates. Please like if you like the content and um, please leave comments um, And uh, because I always enjoy comments. So thanks so much for watching and um, I'll see if I can show you what the smoke is like today. Um, and this is climate crisis, you know, because we this is the first really bad fire we've had here in Tasmania for a very long time and it's burnt about 200,000 hectares and Tasmania is, is you know reasonably large but I mean that's a lot of forest and there's a lot of animals that live in that forest that are either homeless or dead now and uh, pe we've had this fire going for weeks and weeks and weeks now and that's uh, truly so, sort of an und uh, uh, a sort of a very startling event in Tasmania and something to be concerned about and that's the climate crisis and, and Australia is basically bursting into flames all over the place with really really crazy temperatures never seen before and so this is why you know uh, I've invited people to go vegan and there's a reason for that um, I'm not going to post those memes but look up Cowspiracy the sustainability secret but I post memes fairly often that explain the incredibly large study that was done of uh, 40,000 farms in 114 countries from farm to fork and how the, the conclusion they made was the single biggest thing one can do to address climate change and to address the sixth mass extinction and eutrophication and acidification is to go vegan. That's what this largest study ever undertaken so far has said, so please go vegan. Anyway, thanks so, so much for watching. Till next time, bye for now.